like to thank all of the veterans who have served this wonderful country. service at the First United Methodist Church of Interlochen. And again, I'm so glad you're joining us by way of your computer or your tablet and you've accessed the internet to listen to the sermon today and also to the music. I do encourage you to listen to the choir before you listen to the message because the choir is always so uplifting and so encouraging as they minister in song. This is the first Sunday of the month, July the 4th, 2021. So I say happy Independence Day, happy 4th of July, when we look back and realize that we had won our independence from England and we were becoming our own country with the original 13 colonies. It's a very important day in American history and a very important day also in the life of our church. The Methodist Church in America basically started after July the 4th as it was started up by the two different men that John Wesley had put in authority over here on the American continent. Uh, just by way of announcement, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper at the end of the message today. So if you want to put me on pause and get a small piece of bread and a little bit of grape juice so that you can partake of the elements as we walk through the communion service after the message. So I encourage you to do that if you'd like to now, just push pause and I'll look real weird. You can go get your elements, and then you'll be ready to go. Let's open up now in a word of prayer as we begin our time together. Father, thank you for Independence Day. Thank you that we were able to be free as a country. And Father, I also thank you for the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul, Father, told the Galatians, stand fast in the liberty which, which God has set you free in Jesus Christ. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So I thank you that we're not underneath a book of rules and regulations that we have to go by, but we can be filled with your Holy Spirit, follow your Holy Spirit's guiding, and just let you live in our lives, Father, and direct us how to live. Thank you for what it means to be free in Christ. Father, we look to you now as we look into the Word of God. In Christ's name. Folks, for a few minutes, I want you to go back in your mind with me to back when you were in elementary school. All of us can remember follow the leader as a game we would play at recess. The leader would do something and you would have to follow the leader and do exactly what he did to be part of the game. 
There was also another game that we played called Simon Says. And if you remember, the person said, Simon Says, do such and such. And you would have to do it. But then if the person didn't say Simon Says and you did it, well, you lost, and so you had to step out of the game until the last one or two people that were in there, and the last person that didn't foul up got to be win, uh, win the game, and they got to be the person that did Simon Says for the next round. Well, you know, we don't follow Simon as Christians. We follow our Lord, Jesus Christ. And it's so interesting, if you think back to what we saw last week in the message, I love where Paul says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. And then he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now listen closely to this. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. That's what Jesus tells us. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. God doesn't want us to be selfish. He wants us to be self-giving. He wants to be, us to be people that are interested in other people and just not to be self-absorbed. And then we have that beautiful passage where uh, Paul basically lays out is that Jesus was the ultimate example of someone who did that. He was in very nature God, but he did not consider being equal with God something he had to hang on to. He made himself in the likeness of men in the Christ child. He took the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. God's response, Scripture says, God exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things on the earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So now Jesus says to us this morning, he says, therefore, in verse 12, again, I'm reading from the New International Version, uh, chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, and whenever you see a therefore in Scripture, you always ask yourself, what is the therefore, therefore? Well, it's basic, he's basically saying from what he said before about Jesus as the exalted is the uh, exalted example of how to behave and how to be selfless. Therefore, this is how it affects you. He says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now, much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now notice Paul does not say work for your salvation. We know that salvation is a free gift of God and there's nothing we could ever do to earn God's favor. Paul told Titus, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Paul told the Galatians, for by grace have you been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're never saved by our good works, but we are to do good works because we are saved. So make sure you never get the cart before the horse. The horse is faith, and the cart is the good works that follow. And Paul says here to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, when I say work or something like that, a lot of people might think, well, Dave, I've worked hard all my life. I'm retired now. It's time that I just want to do my own thing. I want to spend time with my grandchildren. I want to enjoy my retirement and do different things that I never had enough time to do. And folks, that's fine. I love enjoying my grandchildren. I like traveling a little bit. I like seeing things and doing things that are free. But at the same time, we never really retire from serving God. And also, I think a big problem that comes out when somebody first says work, you think of something that's very laborious. You think about mowing the yard, breaking a sweat, doing something that's really hard. And work is something we tend to recoil from sometimes when we think about the labor that's involved. 
But when you get involved in the work of God, if you're yielded to the Holy Spirit, you'll find that you can serve the Lord and work out your salvation without even breaking a sweat. You can do it. Remember Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. God will not call you to work out your salvation in such a way that it's going to be a drag or be very laborious. He'll help you do it in a very, very positive way. See, what happens when you and I believed in Jesus, maybe when we were a child growing up in the church, we believed in Jesus, or perhaps you came to faith in Christ later in life. When you believed in Jesus, God at that time sent the Holy Spirit to live inside you to be able to fill you and control you and be that divine influence. So you are personally indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and he'll never leave you or forsake you. Secondly, he gave you a new nature to when now you can understand the Bible, you can understand the things of God which you couldn't understand before. You have that spiritual capacity, like the light came on, like we sing the song, Praise the Lord, I saw the light. And also it says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that each person, when they're a believer, when they come to know the Lord, they're given a spiritual gift for the edifying and the building up of the body. So each one of us in here that's a believer has that spiritual gift from God. And I believe when you yield to the Holy Spirit, God will activate that gift he's given you, and you'll really enjoy some of the work that you're doing. I think about the choir members and how I believe a lot of them have the gift of encouragement, the gift of exhortation, and they love singing in the choir. They don't see the choir practice as a drag. They don't see singing in the choir as well. It's just something I've got to do today because I'm in the choir. I've never seen that attitude. They're always perky, ready to go, want to sing for the Lord, and they love doing what God has called them to do because they're activating that gift through the Holy Spirit. I think of other people that have different gifts, and I see those gifts actively in the body and how they encourage one another. You can work for the Lord without even breaking a sweat. You can stay in air conditioning. You can make a phone call and encourage somebody. You can send somebody a positive text with perhaps a scripture text in there that will lift them up to the Lord as they read the Word of God. You can have and interact with people in such a way that it's not a laborious labor that we usually think of when we think about working out something. But just as God gives us the free gift of salvation, he wants us to open up that gift, get that gift out, and then use that gift to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Fear, we respect God and reverence God for who he is, and we realize that one day we're going to be called into account for how we've lived for the Lord uh, after we received our salvation and our spiritual gift. Paul said we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be worthless. Now that's not a judgment for sin. Our sin was judged at the cross when Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. He paid it all, but it's an evaluation of our service for the Lord. Well, we'll receive different rewards. So I encourage you, pray, Father, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Father, show me my gifts. Show me what I'm good at. And I guarantee if you get involved with others, your gifts will start to surface and people will be able to realize your spiritual gifts and what you have. Now, I really love the next verse. After Paul commands them to work at their salvation with fear and trembling, he says in verse 13, For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. It's God who's working in you when you work out your salvation. You know, through the years, I've read different Christian authors and listened to different preachers and pastors, and I see people tend to go off in one of two extremes. There are some people that are very mystical, and they say, well, you just got to let go and let God and let God live the Christian life through you, and you don't have to worry about what you do. Just let go and let God. 
And other people that are like workout people, disciplinarians, athletes, and said, no, you got to get busy and give it your all. Well, I don't believe it's an either or. I believe God says real clearly here, it's a both end. We're commanded clearly to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But then Paul says clearly, it's God who works in you both to will and do according to his good pleasure. It's just like when the inmates in the prison would ask me about getting a job and they would fear that they would not be able to get a job because they had a record. I said, well, if you really believe and you trust God for a job, God will give you a job. You pray, you bring it before the Lord in prayer, but then you go out and you knock on doors. You fill out applications. You fill out applications online. And you keep knocking and you keep filling out paperwork till God opens up the door. You might have to fill out 25 applications, but I guarantee you God will honor that prayer that you want to work with your hands and earn a living. And many of the men called back and told me they'd gotten work. In fact, I can't remember one single inmate who left the chapel that called back and told me that he couldn't find work anywhere. God provides for his people. So it's both then, not either or, us working, but doing it with God's power and God working through us. Now, as we're using our gifts, as we're doing what God has called us to do, he also tells something else not to do. Verse 14 says, do everything without complaining or arguing. Uh-oh, the Holy Spirit's starting to step on our toes right now. Sadly to say, sometimes we can complain, we can argue with one another, we can think about what's wrong here, what's wrong there, we can always see the glass is half full, or half empty instead of half full, excuse me. We can always complain about something, argue with somebody about something, but he says here, do everything without complaining and arguing. Be a person that's willing to get along. Do not have to always win an argument. You know, sometimes you can win an argument but lose the person. I'd rather say I'm sorry and lose the argument and win the person and build a relationship and a friendship than to always have to be right. Besides, none of us are always right. We're not. We're wrong. We make mistakes. We're just humans. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. Notice God wants us to become blameless and pure. Now, stop right here. We'll never become sinless. First John says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We'll always have sinful tendencies and sinful desires, but I think we can by God's sanctifying grace, as John Wesley called it, get to the point where we are mature or perfect in love. He says you may become blameless and pure. If you're blameless, nobody can point a figure at you and show where you're doing wrong. You're living a blameless life, and you're also living a pure life. You're not letting the world seep into your values you're living for the Lord. You're obeying the scriptures as much as you possibly can. You're using your talent. You're using your gifts and that kind of thing. And you can become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, in a crooked and depraved generation. Doesn't that very well describe life around us today? The prophet Amos said, Woe unto them that say good is evil and evil is good. And don't we hear that very thing on the news these days? The social unrest, the riots, the problems that we see, the divide in the country politically. We are really in the midst of this depraved and crooked generation. But what does God want me to do in the midst of that? Look what he says. In which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold forth the word of life. Hold forth the word of life. And the Bible says you can shine like a star. I can't remember a, a, a little song that we used to sing at Christian camps in the past. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no way, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no way, I'm going to let it shine. 
Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And I guarantee you, with a smile on your face and the light of Christ in your life shining forth, you will be like that bright star at midnight that shines in the darkness. And people will see you're different. They'll wonder why you're different. And when they have problems and trials and troubles, I guarantee you, you'll be the one that they want to come and talk to because they see something different. Live that shining light and shine like that star in the universe again as you're holding out the word of life. Paul goes on to tell the Philippians, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ, when Christ comes back for his people, Paul said, I can boast. And I don't think it's the idea of a prideful boasting, but he's basically so happy that the Philippians have followed him in living for Jesus, he says, that I, that I did not run or labor for nothing. My labor and my work in Philippi counted. The people Paul led to the Lord, the people those people led to the Lord, that thriving community in Philippi, that church grew, and Paul knew that he had not labored in vain, or he had not, uh, not run in vain or labored in vain. Look what he goes on to say now here in verse 17. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and will rejoice with all of you. Remember, Paul's at a point in his life here that he possibly could be martyred. And he said, even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering, he reaches back into the Old Testament and brings up that imagery of an Old Testament priest who would bring like a costly goblet of wine before the Lord, and before the Lord he would pour it out on the ground as a drink offering, giving that drink offering to God, acknowledging God for the one who made the grapes grow one who made the produce grow, and they took that fruit, that wine they made from the grapes, and poured it out for the Lord, giving him honor for him being the one that made it grow. And Paul talks about pouring out his life as a drink offering. He said, even if that happens, for the, my service, for your faith, I'm glad, and I will rejoice with all of you. Remember joy 16 times in this epistle we talked about earlier? Now Paul says, I'm even going to rejoice if I pour out my life. You know, when I think about commitment, when I think about fortitude, when I think about stamina, I can't help but think about some of these Olympic athletes that are now training to go to the Olympic Games in Tokyo. Carol and I have watched a couple of shows where they had the gymnasts competing, uh, different shows with some of the swimming events and everything like that. And those people basically have poured out their lives to become the best athlete they could be to compete in the Olympics. And they're just doing it for a temporary crown. If they win, they'll receive a gold medal around their neck. They'll see the flag of their country hoisted high with the national anthem of their country being sung. And they can rejoice that they win a gold medal and that they're at the top of their sport. They're doing it for something that's not going to last. Because eventually, they'll grow older, their bodies will be out of shape, and they'll no longer once be the Olympic athletes they were. You and I, on the other hand, are serving the Lord for an eternal crown. You look up the word crown sometimes, it talks about a crown of righteousness, which God will give people that are faithful. A crown for being a good shepherd. A crown for doing other things in the Lord. And God will give us rewards for how we've lived for Him and how we've served Him. Olympic athletes do it for a temporary crown. We can do it for an eternal crown. And I also think about a movie I saw a good while back. Billy Bob Thornton acted in it. It was The Alamo. And one of the most moving scenes in that movie, The Alamo, is when Travis, Colonel Travis, stood up before the men that were there. They knew that no help was coming. There would be no reinforcements, no relief. And a small group of men, right around 100 men, I believe, stood there. And Travis said, I think you know, man, what Texas means to me. It was a chance for a fresh start, a chance to start over. And he said, I don't know about you, but I am more than willing to sell my life for Texas and to give Sam Houston more time to raise an army to fight the Mexicans. He drew a line in the sand and says, any man that is here is to free can leave if he wants to, or you can step over and join me 
as we gladly sell our lives for Texas. And every single man stood over that land to stand with Travis. And as we know, they were martyred at the Alamo. But what happened? Texas went on to win its freedom. General Sam Houston was victorious over Santa Ana at the Battle of San Jacinto. And we got all the country of Arizona, lots of California and Texas from winning the Mexican War. So Travis sold his life for something dear to him, the freedom of a new life in Texas. Shouldn't you and I sell ourselves out for the Lord? So I really encourage you today, if you do anything else from this message, number one, pray that God would fill you with the Holy Spirit. Secondly, pray that God would show you the gift that he's graced you with, that you can use that gift to minister and help other people. Thirdly, get involved in some kind of a small group meeting. We have the UMW for the women. We also have the ladies' Bible study will be starting back up. Hopefully in time, we'll see a men's group come up, things like that. Get involved and you'll show how God has gifted you as you get involved with those interests. Remember, we're supposed to consider others better than ourselves. And to not only look out at our own interest, but also the interest of others. So I really encourage you. And Paul ends here saying, you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Even if he died, he said, you should be glad about that and rejoice with me because I've been faithful to the Lord and I sold my life for something of eternal value. I heard this, saw this on a plaque years ago and it's always stuck with me. Only one life which shall soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ shall last. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the magnificent grace you've given every one of us in giving the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of us, to give us a new nature, to be able to understand your word and things of God. And thank you, too, for the spiritual gift you've given each one of us. Help us to fan that gift into flame, Lord, as Paul exhorted Timothy with his gift, to do what you've called us to do, to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Help us not to go a day without thinking about you, praying to you, and wanting to serve you with every bit of our hearts. Father, we pray for your grace and your strength to do so. In Christ's name. Amen, folks. I hope you were encouraged through the word, and I encourage you to read back through it again during the week, because you'll be surprised how often a verse can jump off the page and speak directly to you from God's Spirit, and you'll be encouraged. This time, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and uh, if you do have your uh, hymnal available, if you don't there at home, you can just follow me. We're going to be in the red hymnal on page 12. If you would please listen closely and follow along with me. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart, we have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. This time we're going to take the bread and partake, uh, and partake after we go through our great thanksgiving. 
The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Father, pour out your Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now we will pray together the Lord's Prayer, and I encourage you at home to pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This time, if you would pick up the bread that you have there. We will partake together the body of Christ given for you. Amen. Father, we thank you for the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ. You allowed nails to be driven through his hands and his feet, a spear to pierce his side, and a crown of thorns to be beaten down upon his forehead. Thank you that his body was broken, that through his brokenness we might live. And we do pray in his holy name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This time, if you would partake of the cup. Blood of Christ Jesus given for you. Let's partake. Father, thank you for the precious blood of Jesus Christ, 
slain before the foundation of the world as a holy sacrifice unto you. Thank you, Father, we were not redeemed with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the, the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot and blemish. Thank you that through that blood we are cleansed from all our sins. We look to you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. Go forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Again, I do thank you for joining us today. I hope you were encouraged by the choir music and also by our service and communion service. And remember, it's Independence Day, July 4th, 2021. Stand fast in the freedom in which Christ has set you free. Be blessed.